Welcome to Beneath My Rib, trail mix for your spiritual journey. Your hostess is Kathleen Ann Thompson, international missionary, teacher and lecturer, and artistic director of Bellhurst Productions. Kathleen, American-born, was educated in the U.S. as well as in Europe, but has worked ecumenically the last 25 years in Europe, Eastern Europe, and Russia, as well as China, South Africa, and South America. We hope that wherever you find yourself on your spiritual journey, Beneath My Rib will offer you some spiritual nuggets to sustain you on your way. Remember that though your journey may be long, it is never alone. And now, Kathleen. Greetings, my listeners. Nice to be with you again here at the Beneath My Ribs podcast. Today we're talking about Eating at the Table of Toxic Delights. If you have ever had the privilege of helping somebody recover from malnutrition or from the effect of a subpar diet, you were probably duly rewarded with the sense of having contributed something wonderful to somebody as you saw their skin, their hair, their energy, their mental and emotional attitudes all improve and uh, they became new. It's with that spirit and anticipation I would like to share the following thoughts on choosing the table at which we dine in order to receive nutrition or poison in our life. Song of Solomon 2.4 He has brought me into his banqueting hall and his banner over me is love. He sustains me with raisin cakes and refreshes me with apples, for I am faint with love. One early morning, lying in bed, I was engorged and bloated with the gas that comes from eating at the table of toxic delights the night before. Waking up with a spiritual hangover, and emotional indigestion left me in a spiritual malaise as well. I was lying there, and the Holy Spirit suddenly broke into my spirit with a deft, penetrating accuracy. The words were these. You are living so far beneath the nobility, beauty, and dignity to which I created you. Well, I lay there, flattened like a balloon run over by an 18-wheeler, and I started to take careful assessment. What had I done to provoke such a powerful intercession by the Holy Spirit? It didn't take me long to realize that the table I had chosen to dine at the night before was the reference point, the table of toxic delights. It was a watershed moment in my life, and left my jaw hanging, and me questioning, what was I doing? Firstly, I was shocked at the description of myself as being created and seen by God with nobility, full of virtue, authority, wisdom, and grace. And secondly, I was shocked that it seemed I had been slumming willingly with those other vagrants feeding off the dregs of negative and destructive emotional substances. Toxic delights. Why do I call them delights? Well, I do so because they are often sweet to our emotional taste buds in the beginning and can become very addictive while masking their lethal effects. What exactly happened? Okay, here it is. A personal incident had occurred which upset me quite a lot. And I sat down by myself and began to give myself over to the protestations, the arguments, the pity massages, the defenses, the manic fear and anger yo-yo syndrome, and much more. This is what I call the table of toxic delights, fear 
giving way to suspicion, giving way to accusation, giving way to anger, giving way to revenge, to self-pity, to victim status, to bitterness, to depression. In fact, these toxic soul foods, as I call them, are like flesh-eating bacteria, only they are soul eating bacteria, which eats away at our soul tissue and sloughs off the dead tissue as pus, spreading infection to all who are close enough to us or who come into touch with us. Philippians 4, 8 to 9. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is fair, whatever is pure, whatever is acceptable, whatever is commendable, if there is anything of excellence. And if there is anything praiseworthy, keep thinking about these things. Likewise, keep practicing these things. What you have learned, received, heard, and seen in me. Then the God of peace will be with you. That advice from Paul provided fresh conviction, and I felt a deep shame I made a decision that morning. I had many questions and much talking to do with God. But I was certain that the preemptive choice to renounce ever sitting down at that table of toxic delights again was the only wise choice to make. God calls us to a very different table. When the tabernacle was built according to God's detailed design in the Sinai Desert, its purpose was to educate the two million Hebrews as to who God was, who they were, and how to walk into an intimate relationship with him, where provision, guidance, and protection would be with them at all times. When the tabernacle is studied, we see that in the inner chamber called the holy place, not to be confused with the holy of holy places, but the holy place, the middle chamber, housed three pieces of furniture. There was the golden candlestick or candelabra, the altar where the incense was burned, and a table. And upon the table were twelve loaves of showbread. This is called the Lord's table or the table of his presence, the bread of his presence. This is offered to God, and eaten by the priests on the Sabbath. So the bread was made hot and fresh on the Sabbath, put on the table, and the priests ate the previous week's bread. The fulfillment of this type or shadow is pointing, of course, directly to Christ himself, for he is the bread of life, sustaining us with his very being. John six fifty one fifty three, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live for ever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh. Then he added, Except ye eat of the flesh of the Son of Man, you have no life in you. You see, we eat at the Lord's table now since the redemptive work of Christ has given us access and count ourselves all kings and priests. So what is on the Lord's table? It is his presence, his very substance, who he is. We are ingesting his whole being, character and nature. This means we are partaking of trust, kindness, patience, love, security, peace, joy, encouragement, courage. God wants us eating at his table so that we can become mature, strong, and wise in order to govern with him here on this earth. Luke twenty-two thirty, so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit down on thrones to govern the twelve tribes of Israel. And we see that this table is not toxic. It doesn't feed off of our soul flesh, destroying our souls, weakening us, 
weakening our bodies, our soul and spirit, but instead gives life to our body, soul, and spirit. But also, it is delightful. It's exquisitely displayed. It's magnificent in taste and served with beauty and grace. We see this described when the Queen of Sheba comes to visit the table of the King of Israel, Solomon. She was stunned by his table, its presentation, its preparation, and how it was served. 1 Kings 10 to 5. The food was set at his table. His servants sat with him, his ministers in attendance, and how they were dressed, his personal staff and how they were, how they were dressed, even his personal stairway by which he went up to the Lord's temple. She was breathless. The Queen of Sheba, in fact, was gobsmacked at the whole event, dining at the king's table. Now I'm sure that you are already forming the questions which surround the obvious dissonance between the actual bad things that happen to each and every human being in their lives and the admonition to eat only at the Lord's table. So let's address this straight on. I'm like every other human entity. I have a range of God-given emotions which spontaneously arise in response to negative stimuli. It would be unnatural if that were not so. If somebody betrays me, I'm immediately angry, fearful, resentful, hurt, etc. I don't really have a choice to make yet. My emotional reaction is reflexive, spontaneous. However, once those toxic delights appear on the table, it is at this point I have the freedom in God to make a choice what to do with those toxic emotions. I can sit down and eat at that table, nurture myself on that food until it destroys me and everyone around me, or I can sit at another table, the Lord's table. Let me tell you a story. In the ancient Greek civilization, there was a common custom applied to unwanted children. We have many plays which depict this custom. The child was taken out onto the wild, rocky hinterland of the barren islands and given to a herdsman. He took the child and wrapped the child and exposed it naked to the elements. And it was left there until it died. Now, as disgusting an image and actual practice as that is, it was not uncommon in the ancient world. The Mayas, Aztecs, and many other civilizations practiced similar customs. I would like to use, though, this example and exchange all the parts in it to give you another picture. So let's replace unwanted children with unwanted foods. Cut off the table of toxic delights. Those emotions of fear, suspicion, accusation, self-pity, depression, resentment, etc., then, let's replace the barren hills of ancient Greece with the cross of Jesus Christ. Then, finally, we'll replace the hostile elements which affected the death of a child out there with the blood of Jesus, which brings life, healing, and strength. In my metaphoric illustration, I can take my anger, suspicion, fear, resentment, all of those toxic attitudes, emotions, which are all wrapped up in a bundle designed usually to hide it and instead expose it by laying it on the ground at the foot of the cross. Then I can uncover it, make it naked by openly confessing to Christ my sin and indulging in those toxic foods and let the blood of Jesus cover it, drop by drop. The negative emotions begin to disintegrate with every drop of Christ's healing, restoring living blood. And a resurrection starts to occur. New healing bread begins to appear, foods which nourish us, comfort us, 
Give us reconciliation, forgiveness, understanding, patience, hope, and justice all appear on the table. I'm an artist, and I've been working for 50 years in the arts. I have always tried to keep my working environment free of emotional toxicity. I understood very early in my career that creativity is made mute, null and void in the presence of negative soul-eating emotions. But before I was a Christian, I had no real honest way of controlling that. Emotions are strong, unrelenting, and real. It wasn't until I met Jesus and read Psalm 23 that I understood how to do this. Psalm 23, 5. You prepare a table before me, even in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, and my cup overflows. You see, God understood we would all find ourselves in the presence of that which threatens us, attacks us, misuses us, harms us. So he supplied for us a table at which we could sit and eat at those times. As we eat of that table, of true delectable treats, his anointing begins to pour over us. His divine favor comes down upon us and our cup of living water is more than we can drink. How can we do that? He can do that because he is peace. He is joy. He is love. He is truth. He is wisdom. And that's what it means to eat of him, his presence, the bread of his presence. It's a mystery. If this is true, that God can transform our toxic foods into delectable treats, well, why don't we willingly do this? Why do we not only eat at that toxic table, but also allow ourselves to bury our nod, poisonous bones in secret places in our souls so that we can dig them up again, time after time, and chew vigorously on them again. Well, we should be clear that I call the toxic foods delights because they do have a very addicting taste in the beginning. It often feels good to shout and bang, to take a warm, sudsy bath in our own self-pity, to gossip humorously and mockingly with others, to throw the riot act and defend the accusations, to entertain ourselves with all kinds of wild suspicions. But soon, your relationships, your level of creative energy, your sense of well-being and positive aspiration, your sleep, And your health begins to show signs of stress and disintegration. The soul-eating bacteria of toxic delights is at work. It takes faith to lay those toxic foods at the foot of the cross and say, Jesus, give me true wisdom on this circumstance in my life. Tear down my own faults, imaginings, and suspicions. Let me see it from your eyes. Show me how you see it. I give up these negative reactions and ask for true satisfaction and guidance toward resolution, reconciliation, provision, healing in this circumstance. When people or circumstances greatly offend us, it makes me think of somebody shooting indelible ink darts at us. It is the same process when we spew toxicity on others in retaliation. In both cases, a stain of indelible ink marks the source of the wound. You may have been the recipient of a dart, or you may have in a spontaneous moment projected a dart of your own, 
that left a stain of indelible ink on your soul or somebody else's. Just as it is with real indelible ink, you cannot wash it off. It eventually comes off, but only because the dead skin sloughs it off. This is what God does for us in renewing our souls. His blood kills our soul-eating bacteria and heals the wound with new living tissue. I take you back to the message from the Holy Spirit I received in bed that morning. You are living so far beneath the nobility, beauty, and unique design to which I created you. When I made that decision that day to no longer sit at the table of toxic delights, I can tell you it was not an easy change to make, especially in the beginning. And to be honest, I sometimes take three steps forward and one step back. But progress I am making. That's for sure. Despite the daunting prospect of doing it, this is what the Bible says we are called to do, to overcome evil in this world. And it is only by partaking of him alone who is capable of overcoming evil that we can do it. Ephesians 6, 12. For our struggle is not against human opponents, but against the rulers, authorities, cosmic powers in the dark world around us, the evil spiritual forces in the heavenly realm. 2 Corinthians 10.4 For the weapons of our warfare are not those of the world. Instead, they have the power of God to demolish fortresses, false imaginings. We tear down those arguments, those accusations, and every proud obstacle, our suspicions and resentment, every proud ar- obstacle that is raised against the knowledge of God We tear it down, taking every thought captive in order that it agrees with the Messiah. You see, the most powerful spiritual weapon we have to overcome evil is to move in the opposite direction that evil wants us to move. I began to adopt three practical steps to try to come closer to living in that nobility beauty, and dignity to which God had created me. I will share these with you. Number one, walk away from situational tables where people are insisting on eating toxic delights. I no longer remain in the company, even of close relationships, where they insist on dining on the poisonous dishes. Number two, I take any indelible ink stain that manages to get to me immediately to the cross. I surrender my wound to what I know Christ offers me, his love for me. I unwrap my toxic foods and confess my temptation to eat of them. You see, his wisdom on how to handle the situation, his compassion to see the situation clearly from his eyes, his incredible grace to provide what I need in order to move on in a prudent and profitable way, his justice, all of that begins to drop his blood upon my toxic delights and change them into foods, kingly foods, on his table, foods of healing, foods of wisdom, foods of reconciliation, foods of peace. Number three, praise God without ceasing, in song, in word, in movement, while speaking his scriptures, his words back to him as the temptations arise in me 
to once again taste of those toxic foods. I find his words and instead speak those words back to God, thanking him, thanking him for the promise of those words, for the truth of those words, for the healing power of those words. I start thanking him for his guidance, his comfort, his justice in this situation, knowing that in time all of those things which are Christ will start to change the situation. The change begins with me and then spreads outward. It's a constant conversational prayer with him and a walk of faith. But those who wait upon the Lord, will rise like eagles. They will fly, and they will run, and they will not tarry. They will grow in strength and faith. This is what it means to eat at his banquet table. I am always rewarded in a very short time as I experience his changing me within the circumstances. This is causes me, this causes me to press in even deeper as I sense a total victory coming. Even if the circumstances don't change, I am changed, which changes everything. I can well imagine that you may be saying to yourself, well, I agree with the delineation of that problem and would like to change something for myself. But what you're suggesting is far too simplistic and biblically cliched. I would like to suggest to you that this doesn't offend me. I totally understand. I was there myself. However, God's truth laid out in his word is not simplistic. But it is simple. It is simple enough for anyone to understand or to do. And the results are far from prosaic. They are actually nothing short of miraculous. Because he is real. And it is that same power which raised Christ from the dead that is now available to us to raise our toxic-laden lives to resurrection life. The impediments to surrendering our wound and our toxic foods and the pleasure of eating them to Christ and sitting down at his table instead to eat of his presence are two, mainly as I see it. Firstly, we must make a faith-based decision to trust that God's word is real. Not just a theological truth, but I mean practically real. The decision to believe that and set aside our cynicism, fatalism, and pessimism is a large stumbling block for many on the path. Many a time I've said to God, as it was written in his word, Okay, God, I'm having trouble believing, but I choose to believe I'm going to set my heart and soul to believe. Help my unbelief. I want to tell you that he is faithful to hear and answer that prayer. But we must first make that firm decision to set our hearts, our souls, our minds to believe. Secondly, we will need to surrender up the self-sustained suffering that becomes a part of our existence sometimes, becomes a part of our identity. I'm not trivializing the negative impact that circumstances can have on us. What I am saying is that we must give up the holding and sustaining of those negative emotions. Circumstances may or may not change. Sometimes they change right away. Sometimes it's a long ways down the road. But what does change in is us, in the circumstances. We are the miracle. Our reality becomes not the circumstances, but the life of Christ within us, creating a different reality. 
I'd like to end this podcast with a story, a very personal and intimate story, which has fueled my commitment to speak into this subject. In 2009, I experienced a kind of visitation which took me three and a half years to process. Part of that personal revelation was a specific input from the Lord, which went something like this. Let me just put it in the form of a monologue with God as a speaker. I don't want you to separate from me. If anything comes between us, any stress, fear, anger, resentment, bitterness, depression, envy, all toxic delights, I want you to run to me quickly, immediately. Get close into me. Stay there, feeling only my love for you. Do not Tell me about your problem. Concentrate only on my heart for you. Stay there until you are totally immersed in me. And when you totally feel embraced by my love for you and are certain of it, then and only then can you talk to me about your problem. This was one of the most radical things that happened to me at that time, changing my life permanently. I saw that the answers to my problems were to increase my experience and knowledge of his love for me, not to have a specific plan to right my wrong. And when I did get around to talking to him about the problem, Everything was different because I was different. I felt loved and treasured, not threatened, but secure in his care for me. And I saw things differently, not defensively or resentfully. And I could receive guidance then from the Holy Spirit how, how to handle the problem without sitting down at that poisonous table. As I did this, I was freed from the captivity of those toxic emotions in my situations. For indeed, they are slave owners. And the shackles of fear, suspicion, resentment, guilt, depression, etc. are real. My trust in the Lord grew in huge ways. And then circumstances did began to change. Try it, my friends. And may God richly reward your efforts. Thanks for being here. Keep in touch with us. We love to hear from you. And if you're a theater enthusiast, you can check out my other podcast channel, Whispers in the Wings, where we converse about theater techniques. Till our next episode on Beneath My Rib, This is Kathleen Ann Thompson wishing you inspiration and strength on your spiritual journey. You've been listening to Kathleen Ann Thompson on Beneath My Rib. Please visit us at www.bellhurst.com.